Okay, so welcome. Good morning. Welcome to the Mashiach Matters class. I think we're holding at class number 127, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. We are over here in the middle of Parshas Vayishlach, finding out how Mashiach matters and how much it matters and how it's, Mashiach is really the entire Torah. No, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't Vayishlach. We're holding a Parshas Toldos. I'm sorry. And we are holding over here by a Pasuk that I don't think we've ever spoken so much about a verse, and I'm still not done with this verse. Like some of these verses are like, some of the Psukim are intensely, intensely, intensely Mashiach. Okay. Ooh, where are we over here? The birth, Yaakov and Esav. Here we are. And afterwards his brother goes out. The Yodai in his hands, Oichezez, is gripping Ba'kev Esav and the heel of Esav. We've discussed so much on this. And he called him Yaakov. I think this is already the fourth or fifth class on this Pasuk. I want to read to you a little medrash. It says his brother came out and after... I mean, after Esau is born first, his younger brother Esau, uh, Yaakov comes out. His hand is gripping the heel of Esau. And obviously that is very, very symbolic and very telling. So the Medrash says like this, After the kingdom of Esau, there's no other kingdom in the world. Once Esau is done, now remember, Esau translates into Edom, Edom translates into Rome. Even though there was an Edomite kingdom um, earlier, before Rome, but as it's discussed, and, and Abarbanel talks about it and others, how the Edomite, the ancient Edomites, ended up the ace of descendants to become the Roman Empire. That's why they were the ones who destroyed the second temple. And they were the ones who initiated this long and dark exile for the Jewish people, close to 2,000 years. The Roman Empire translated into the Christian West. And that continues in all the Western countries, including the United States of America. Now, there are those who are, and as discussed in so many classes up, up till now, we are now at the cusp of the redemption of the Jewish people. We've seen already the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. We've seen already this year the rise of the city of Jerusalem. We see the deep tension in the world regarding all of this. We see the ma miraculous transformation of the United States of America under the current administration through President Trump. And as I've been mentioning all the time that this is a godly element, this is not just regular, ordinary politics as usual, this should not have happened based on the natural course of events. There was clear, clearly intervention in the past, in the 2016 election. The question is, who intervened? And, you know, whether it's the Russians, this, that. And the answer is God intervened. What's the idea? The time has come for the rise of the kingdom of Mashiach. That's the Jewish kingdom. And as I mentioned many times, it's not threatening. It's not in any way that's harmful, quite on the contrary. It's going to lead, elevate, purify, and bring to the ultimate goodness of all of humanity. There's nothing to be scared of. It's not, God forbid, some kind of, some kind of a, uh, some kind of a dictatorship. Hashem's kingship, God's sovereignty, through the embodiment of Mashiach is going to be accepted by the entire world joyfully and happily once it's revealed. And before that, Esau has to conclude his kingdom. The United States of America is the, la the last leg of Esau's power and its kingdom. Now some people wonder, are the Chinese going to be the next rulers of the world? You know, with all, I don't know, all the reasons why. So that's comforting to what we see over here. Chinese are not Edomites. 
the Russians definitely are not going to rule, even though they could also be from Edom. They've already they've had their empire already. See, it's, it's, everybody had their turn. The Chinese are not going to rule. How do we know? Because it says in this Medrash, after Edom is done, through the various different faces of Edom, after Edom is done being king and having its dominion over the world, the next Malchus that's going to take over is the Malchus of Israel, the Malchus of the Jewish people. So the Medrash says, L'kachnema ba'akev. Akev, Esau, means right after, samoch, attached. And so it says, V'hoya acharikein, it will be after this. Well, what's going to happen? Same words like over here. It says, V'acharikein, Yatza Achiv, after this, his brother came out. So the same words, acharikein, it says, Esh poiches ruchi al kol basar. God says, I'm going to pour my spirit over all mankind. Which means it will come a time of tremendous divine enlightenment which is going to coincide with the fall, or not say fall, but the ending of the Edomite kingdom and the rise of the kingdom of God, of holiness in the world. After the kingship of Esau. But regarding Esau, it says, So we know in Torah literature, we know that Esau himself is compared to the Chazer. Chazer is a pig. The thing about the pig is, it's called Chazer. One of the reasons it's called Chazer, Chazer means it will return. It's a non-kosher animal, but it becomes kosher. That's what it says, and the future pig will be kosher. Now, again, we discussed this. You will ask your rabbi <laughs> when you can start eating pig. Simply, I don't know if it will ever be, I don't know if you'll ever be able to have uh, um, bacon and eggs. I don't know, it's a question, if the pig will actually physically become kosher. Very possible it will. The question is whether regarding Torah, the laws can't change, Torah is forever. But the question is maybe the pig will change. Once the pig starts, has, um, begins to chew its cut, which is possible, uh, if we have a change in nature, then it will be kosher. But I'm not gonna get into that, but the symbolism and the idea that the pig will become kosher means that Esau, who has been an, an anti, an antithesis to holiness and in the world, will have a complete transformation, will have a metamorphosis. And that's what he says. Why is he called Chazer? Not just he will return, but Shemachzeres Malchus Lebalel. He's going to bring back the kingdom to its rightful owner. In other words, the rightful owner of kingship always belongs to God. God is king over the world. No one is king. See, that's the problem. It's not a competition over here. We're king, you're king. That's silly. It's ridiculous, immature. God is king. Hashem manifests His word, just like God gave the Jewish people the Torah and, and the seven Noahid laws, that they should teach humanity. So God's kingdom also finds expression through a physical human being like King Solomon who sits on the throne of God. That's what it says. He's sitting on. It means he's ruling on behalf of Hashem. We discussed this many times what that means. In any case, that's what the Medrash says. Like it says, that the Moshiach, those that were saved, will go up on the mountain of Zion, on, the, on uh, Lishpoi, to judge. And remember, we spoke many times, judging doesn't mean to punish, it means to rectify the mountain of Esau. And then God will have, So this is happening now. This is happening right now, as we discussed this idea. So we, what I'm saying here, it's very clear. That when Yaakov is holding on to the Akev of Esau, to the heel of Esau, this is reflected in this great, this great idea of what's happening right now. There is some transitioning stage where Esau will assist Yaakov. And the United States of America this year, beginning last year, has, given, has made a complete turnaround in its approach to, his, to his Israel. They've always been a supporter, but there's always been a kind of a supporter with a supporter and kind of keeping Israel on a leash and kind of telling, and, and, and right, there's, been, there's been, you know, demanding that Israel be ready to make concessions of a two-state solution to the Palestinians and so on and so forth, and this kind of stuff. That has ended. We're not feeling that, we're not sensing that. We've never seen a friendlier United States to Israel. And such, and the fact that it recognizes Jerusalem as the Jewish kingdom, that's, that's huge. That's huge, that's, that's purely Mashiach. On these words, his brother will go out. But let's understand something. The main thing over here is not just the politics of it. The main thing of it is what's behind it all, that after all of this, there's going to be 
as this will happen, the Medrash just mentioned, there will be incredible godly revelation of the world. Let's expect an explosion of spiritual yearning and powerful enlightenment and godly consciousness in the world. It's not for now. It's a discussion onto its own. But across the world, I am sensing from what I am seeing, from every bit of news that I am hearing, holiness is winning. Holiness is being victorious. Everything changed from two years ago. Everything that is holy is becoming more pronounced and, and having a... For example, this week there was a challenge in a court in Chicago by someone who called himself a Satanist. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Okay, maybe that's all. In any case, so he clearly is saying that he is an agent of the other side, the unholy. And he challenged the United States dollar that it says in God we trust. And the court completely dismissed it. Uh, and, and said it's not a religious, I'm not exactly, I didn't read the, the, the thing, but the fact that they said it's not a religious symbol, it's just, uh, see, the awareness of God has to stop becoming a religion. A religion means it's like, you know, what some people decide to believe in or not. It's not a religion, it's reality. In God we trust. Yeah, we trust in God, obvious. What else are you going to tell me? The, blue, the sky is blue? Yeah. In God we trust. It's an intrinsic awareness that every creature and every being has in a creator. Of course, during the times of concealment, God has enabled that there should be elements that obscure and can create enough confusion that people should question this. But once we come to the revelation at the end of days, it becomes very, very obvious. So again, it stops being a religion. It's not religion anymore. All religions will fall away. There will be an awareness of God and a service to Hashem, how God wants to be served. For the Jewish people, 613. For the nations in the world, seven. Fine. It's what it is. Another victory, the Supreme Court, a victory for decency, a victory for marriage this week, in which they rule that the person who did not want to make the cake based on his religious beliefs, that, which are moral beliefs, he doesn't believe that, we, that, that humans can decide whatever we want to do. There is a, there's a ruler, there's a king. There's someone who set up this rule, this world with certain rules. And the rules that he gave to man is that a man will marry a woman. And there's a sanctity to this marriage, to the home. So to create a marriage that's not between a man and a woman, but the way people say we feel like it, that's a rebellion against God. I mean, obviously people are not necessarily all saying I'm rebelling against God, but that is a rebellion. And I'm not saying, you know, everybody's got different temptations. It's not about judging anybody about, you know, what their sexual desire will be. That, that's not, I have my issues. I have to fight with my own evil inclination. Everybody's got. The question is that when you go and you make a marriage from it, you're getting married means that you're... You're not saying it's, it's, it's something I'm struggling with. You're saying that this is the right thing to do. That's a problem. So then, as a result of that, so what happens? Um, unlike what was been going on in America that up till last year, where there was a tremendous sh pushing it in your face to every person that not only am I allowed to do whatever I want to marry whoever I want, but you have to accept me. And you have to see it as, and to the point that if you don't want to make a cake for my wedding, you are, uh, you're, you are, uh, you're discriminating. So for the fact that the Supreme Court, Supreme Court ruled the way they ruled, that's huge. That's a victory for holiness. The Me Too movement this year is a victory for holiness. Men had issues, mistreated women, that had power and thereby felt that they can abuse women. That is against God's will. So the whole overthrowing of that, and that a woman has, which in general, Kabbalistically, I'm not gonna get into it right now, the Sianic consciousness is a very feminine type of, of a consciousness. The rise of the feminine energy in the correct way, not in the corrupted way, but in the correct way. So that is huge. This week, the announcement of the Miss America pageant that I, that I saw, that we're not going to judge people anymore based on their external appearance. 
their body. But the, but the judgment, the way we're going to look at people is on their content. Now, over here, let's understand. I mean, there's nothing wrong with physical beauty. Torah demands modesty. Yeah, Torah demands modesty. But physical beauty as a reflection of something deeper, not as a disconnect of seeing it as a virtue onto its own. The change of that focus and turning that into is very messianic. Wherever I turn and wherever I look in the news, holiness is triumphing and the unholy is falling. So therefore, let's take a look at the verse, same Pasuk, Sefer Kol Yaakov, um, which I think is from the, one of the Navaminsky Rabbeim. He says, after, what happens? After Esau's kingdom, the Achri Cain, and afterwards Yacha Achiv, his brother, will come out. The word Achiv, he says, is keep, contains within it, which means his brother, which is Yaakov, also contains a deep godly secret. Achri Cain, after the rule of Esau is over, because as long as the, there is a dominion, see, as long as Esau has dominion in the world, there is a certain blockage in a, 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 of forces of unholiness that are blocking and not allowing the expression of the divine in the world. The ultimate expression of the divine in the world is going to be when there's going to be a holy temple in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem, and where Kedusha is going to reign over the entire world. Holiness is going to reign. So take a look at the, at, at the words. He says, Yachiv is spelled Aleph Ches Yud Vav. So he says, these are the four colors associated with the four letters of the tetragrammaton. The Yud Kei Vav Kei, God's unpronounceable name. The essence of godliness, which until Mashiach comes is hidden. So he says the four colors, because these four letters are related to four colors. I, I, again, I don't know the source of this, um, other than this Sefer, other than this uh, writing. Aleph stands for the word Adam, which means red. Ches stands for the word Chiver, which Chiver means white. Yud stands for the word Yaroik which is either yellow or green. And Taf stands for the word Tichla, which is blue. So we got red, white, red, white, green, and blue. Four colors associated with God's name. So what is it saying? Va'acharei Cain, and after the exile. And also he says more than that. Cain, the word Cain, is the numeric value of 70. Chaf Nun, 70. After the rule of the 70 nations, which concludes with Esau, once Esau's kingdom is over, the 70 don't rule anymore. It's the completion of the 70. That's why Trump, when he became president, because he completes this kingship, is 70 years old when he becomes president. And the year 777, as we once discussed, everything is seven. Because it's the completion of the seven, and it's making room for the eighth dimension, which is Mashiach's kingdom. Mashiach is number eight for various different reasons. His name ends, concludes with the letter Ches, which is number eight, the power of the eighth dimension, which is the power of the infinite. In any case, Va'achri Cain, after the 70 are over, Yatza Achiv, there is a great godly revelation of his brother, which is Hashem's name, the Yudke Vavke. Also, in Davening, we say, Yoitzer Oyer, he creates light. Ubore Choshech, I'm sorry, he forms light. Ubore Choshech, and he creates darkness. So the words Yoitzer, Oyer, Ubore Choshech, their acronym, the Rosh Tevis, the acronym, the first letters, are the same letters as the word Achiv. Yoitzer, the, the Yud from Achiv has a Yud, that's Yoitzer. The Aleph of the word Achiv is Oyer. The Vav, the last letter Vav, is Uboire, and he creates. And the Ches is Choshech. So who is the one? who forms light and creates darkness, it's the one and only one. Now God does a lot of things, but in this verse is the idea that God is omnipotent, that he can do the opposites, light and darkness, two opposites. So that's referring to the tetragrammaton, whose the power of it is, is, is endless and infinite. The Achar Cain, and after the completion of the 70, Yotza Achim, we have a powerful revelation of his brother, which is godly in this, which is, which is a local. So we're literally at the cusp of an explosion of powerful, godly, transcendental energy in the world. And we need to know this and prepare ourselves for this.
I'd like to take you back to the discussions that we had last week on the Midrash. The Midrash says, and I said this Midrash many times to you in the last few weeks, but I keep on seeing deeper secrets and deeper secrets in this Midrash. Not me, I'm quoting to you from great rabbis, in which the Midrash says as follows. The Midrash tells a story that there was a nobleman, and that nobleman, there was a nobleman, There was a nobleman, and that nobleman um, challenged, the nobleman challenged the, uh, the rabbis. And he said, who's going to take the kingdom after us? So he, who's going to, meaning we're so powerful. He, he, was, a, he, was, a, he was a Roman, uh, a Roman officer, a Roman, a, Roman, a Roman nobleman. And he said, um, Who's gonna who's gonna take be able to conquer? I mean, we're so powerful. We... So um, he took out a clean sheet of paper and he wrote on it, his hands is holding on to the to the to the he wrote he quoted this verse. His hand is holding on to the heel of Asaph. That's what he showed it to him. And then the old man, and then the they, they said, that this is not clear in the Medrash, who said, Wow, take a look. Old, old information coming out of an, a new sage. And, and, and this comes to inform you how much pain that Tzaddik had all along. So we, we, we spoke about this a lot, the cryptic statement, why does he need a clean pa- piece of paper? Why couldn't you just tell it to him? What's the symbol, sim- symbolism? It says it was a clean piece of paper and that he wrote it. And what does it mean, old, old, old information coming from a new Tzaddik, coming from a new sage? And what does it mean? This is all to teach you how much this tzaddik pained himself, how much, what what is this cryptic statement? You know, the sages, when they wrote something or they said something back then, it was all written by divine inspiration. So there is endless secret in what they write. So I'd like to share with you a few interpretations of this, other than what we've discussed earlier. The Kasav Sofer, that's the son of Ramosha Sofer, known as the great Hungarian rabbi of the early of the early nineteenth uh, century um, writes as follows. I just want to hold on. Let me just open this up. I think it's over here. Early nineteen? No, no. It was the early nineteenth century. It's the early eighteen hundreds. Yes. The Chassam Sofer is the early eighteen hundreds. Yep. So he says like this, um, what's, the, what's the significance of this debate? He says an interesting idea. In Tehillim we say, when God is going to return the exiles of Zion, of Zion, we're going to be like dreamers. It's going to be like a dream. What's going to happen then? It says, we're going to laugh. It'll shine in your arena, and we're gonna, and our tongues are gonna be full of joy. Az yomru bagayim. Then it's gonna be said amongst the nations, Higdil Hashem lasoisim ela. God has done great things with them, with these. Higdil Hashem lasoisim manu. God has done great things with us. Ayinu semechem. We were happy. What is the psalmist? What is King David? What is David Melech saying in Tehillim? What is this deeper meaning of this idea? We're gonna be like a dreamer. We're living through a nightmare. The Jewish people have gone through a hellish nightmare of persecution, of oceans of tears and rivers of blood have, have been spilled as we made our way through this treacherous minefield called exile with injury, insult, abuse, uh, persecution. In the end, we've come out intact. We're here. We're still here. The biggest miracle in the world, the Jewish people are still here. But, you know, as mentioned in the earlier classes last week, we would expect that we were a broken people. We were a people broken and shattered. Who knows how many thousands of years of therapy we will need to be able to reclaim the true dignity and the true honor of, the, of Israel, of the Jewish people, our true light. In a sense, and, and also, like, the, the, you know, when the, he, brings, he brings an interesting idea. He says when a, when, let's say now, uh, but when you have a new, a new, um, a new government or a new king, 
So the new king takes over the, 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 the country and he implements his ideals, his, his agenda, what he, what he believes in, his, his philosophy. And the country is like moving in that direction. But there was an old king. So history is not, is not erased. In other words, when, it, when we look at history, we have two stories. We will have the, the, the recording and the, and, the, and the story relating the previous king and the direction in which the previous king or the pre previous government was taking the country. And then uh, you'll have a, a new king, the second king, and the second king turned the country in a different direction. So the, you, the, the, it's, it, it doesn't change things retroactively. The new, the new king or the new government is changing, the, like take a look now. There, there, there's a new shift in the government of the United States moving things in a different direction than the previous administration. Well, you know, for good or for bad, either way, whatever, 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 whatever you believe in, I'm not interested. I mean, it's not, it's not about our one's political views now. The idea is a change, but but in American history, there will be the Obama years and there will be the the the, uh, the the Trump era or whatever, and that's the way it is. He says, when Moshiach will come, we're going to be waking up to a dream. That means there's going to be a realization for the Jewish people that the entire kingdom of Esav of thousands of years of Esau's dominion had, was not a reality. Didn't have any, anything to it. It was more an element of the imagination. It seemed like they had power. It seemed like they were strength. It seemed like there was something to it. There was really nothing to it. It's going to be a dream. When you wake up in a dream, even though the last hour, you were dreaming for the last hour, I don't know how long dreams take, but you were dreaming, and while you were experiencing the dream, the dream was so real, when you wake up, you see how ridiculous it is. It's nothing to it. It's, it doesn't have any substance to it. The, and that's the meaning of the verse. When God is going to bring back the returners of, of Tzion, the Jewish people, we're going to be waking up from a dream, looking back at the thousands of years of abuse and the thousands of years of Esau's kingdom as, as with, that, it ha, that it doesn't have anything to it. It seemed to be so powerful, so strong, that it had such substance and such strength, it really, really, really was a hot air balloon without any substance at all. And that's the meaning that what? Um, that's going to bring tremendous laughter because it's going to be so amusing to realize that what we were so terrified from, that which was so real and that which was such a... The, the, there was... So, talk about a... a, a um, Talk about a, uh, a nightmare if you look at all that, all the, all the persecutions, including the Inquisitions, the Crusaders, and, and, uh, and even the Holocaust. I mean, how can you, right? And today we can't imagine how that could be retroactively. I mean, we can't imagine it. It doesn't make any sense to us now. But once we, God opens up our consciousness, Hashem opens up our awareness, and we can see things from a godly perspective, we will see that the whole thing never existed. It didn't have any reality to it. And we're going to laugh. And we're going to laugh two things. We're going to laugh at the emptiness of that previous kingdom, how empty and false it was, and how lacking of substance it was, how imaginary it was. And our mouths are going to be full of song about the greatness of, and the truth and the substance of the Jewish kingdom, of the holy kingdom, of truth that's going to prevail in the days of, in the, day, in the messianic era, in the days of Mashiach. And let's continue that further. That's why it says, Oz Yom Rubago, and let's see what the nations are going to say. The nations are going to say, Higdil Hashem Lasos Em Elek. God did great with these, with the Jewish people. Look what he's given them. Remember, let's understand something. I'm going to emphasize this again. The Jewish Elevation in the Messianic era is not going to crush the nations. Quite on the contrary, it's going to elevate the nations to experiences and to enjoyment and to pleasure way beyond they've ever had. It's something of truth. But the nations are going to say, that's true greatness. Higdal Hashem Simanu. When God did great things with us over the last few thousand years, when we thought we're the movers and the shakers of the world and we thought we had power, we rejoice thinking that it's something. But now we too are waking up to the dream how this was really only a dream. This deep idea is what this rabbi 
uh, Rebbe Gamliel or Rebbe Meir, whoever it was, showed the Roman nobleman when he told him who's going to take over the, 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 the kingdom after us. We're so powerful, we're so strong, you guys are so abused, you're so beaten by us, you're defeated. So he took out a, sh a white, clean sheet of paper and he said to him, you see this sheet of paper, it's clean, nobody ever wrote on it. It's as if nothing ever happened. It's like a person after a dream, there's no scars from the nightmare if, it, it was, if you realize it was only a dream. We, the Jewish people, don't even have a scar. There's nothing there. It's clean, it's, 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 we're simple. The, the, we're unscarred and unscathed by all the darkness. Because, and it's as if there was no, here's the thing, it's as if there was no other kingship ever before. It's as if this is the first kingdom in the world. It, there's no history of a past kingdom. And that's the meaning of, he writes to him on a clean piece of paper, as if history is beginning now. What does he write to him? V'achar kach Achiv, his brother comes out, Yaakov, v'yodoy oichezez ba'kev Esav, and his hands are holding on in Esav's heel. Um, it means after Esav, Yaakov becomes the ruler and the king over the world. Um, that's his peerage. Now, in, in, um, in the same lines, but an incredible, incredible, beautiful um, way, I'd like to share with you another interpretation. And this one is similar to this, but from a sefer called Dvar Yesharim. Dvar Yesharim, his name was Reb Chaim. I didn't know, I never heard of him before. I looked him up today. He was a student of Rebbe Leibola Eger. Rebbe Leibola Eger was a grandson of Rebbe Akiva Eger. And he, was, and he came from, the, from a non-Hasidic world and he became a Hasid, Rebbe Leibola Eger. And he had a student, he had a, 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 you know, a Hasid of his. His name was Reb Chaim Eliezer. Uh, what was his last name? I forgot. It's Margolis. In any case, so he wrote the Sefer Dvar Yisharim, but because I was so excited about his peerage that I, 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 I ran and I, I, I had to Google him and look him up to find more information about him because he's just... Anyways, he explains this whole dialogue between the sage and the, um, and the nobleman as follows. Um, when we say kingship, see, ultimately, we need to... The whole, the whole point of Mashiach coming is the revelation of God's kingship in the world. And, but not just dominance over, over, over humanity, over the eight billion people in the world, but a very deep sovereignty over each and every one of us. Every single person is a servant of God Almighty. As if there's no other people in the world, you're the only one. And like, like it says in Tanya, it says that every day we're supposed to think all the time that God casts away the spiritual worlds with all the gazillion of angels and all the spiritual realms, God moves it all to the side. Hashem dismisses everything. And He specifically unifies and designates His kingship and His kingdom on us individually, on every single person, every single Jew as an individual. Now, every day, as a Jew, we're supposed to accept upon ourselves the heavenly yoke. I'm a servant of God. But he says it's impossible for us to do that today in the right manner. It's, it's close to impossible. Or if we can achieve it, it takes a lot, a lot, a lot of work and a lot of exertion. Even then, it's only, it's incomplete. Why? What does it mean that you're accepting upon yourself God's kingship? It means that you have a deep and powerful conviction and a, a certainty. You're absolutely sure and convinced that you're in God's hands 100%. And that there is no other force in creation that has any validity or any power or any say in your life. It's like you and your king, the king and I. That's it. And everything I need to have in my life is only from you. You're the absolute controller of my life and therefore I am devoted to you 1000% I don't have any other you know eggs and other in other boxes or no what's it called uh, what's the expression don't put all your eggs in, in one basket so I don't have any other things that I rely on partially 
like this, you know, I have God, but I also have my rich uncle so-and-so that will be handy when I need, or so-and-so, this one or that one. I have connections, government connections, or this connection or that connection. That's all what we say in Yiddish, Baba Maises. That's all not true. It appears because God hides. He shrouds himself in many veils. So a person has to come to this clarity. So he, he, he brings a powerful statement from Tractate Brachas, from the Talmud and Tractate Brachas, the Gemara. Rabbi Yochanan says, what should a person do if he wants to accept upon himself Malchus Shemayim Shlema? He wants to accept upon himself a complete acceptance of the heavenly kingdom. What should you do? So Rabbi Yochanan says five things the person has to do. Yifne, the first thing, and now again, I'm going to relate to you what the Talmud says, and we're going to read it first on its simple meaning, but then we're going to unravel the deeper meaning, the deeper spiritual meaning in behind his words. Rabbi Yochanan simply is saying, what's the right way to say the Shema every day, to accept upon yourself the heavenly kingdom? What do you do? First thing Rabbi Yochanan says is you have to go to the bathroom. Strange thing, you wouldn't have expected it. Why? Because Allah is, Allahically, when a person has, has not emptied his, his, uh, his waist, you're not supposed to say the Shema. Because you're not, you're, you're whatever, it's not, you're not in a clean state. So, so a person should go to the bathroom first, and he should wash his hands the next day. He should put on the tefillin, which we wear in our heads, and our arm. He should say the Shema, and then he should pray. Five things. So here the deeper meaning that this rabbi, uh, this, this sefer, uh, sees in, in these words. The first thing is yifna. Yifna means clean yourself out from any thought that anybody else has any power in your life. No one has power. Not your boss, not your mother-in-law, not your wife, not your husband, not your kids, not your cousins, not society, not other people, nothing. There's only one that has control over my life is only God. Yifna, that means get rid of the waste, get rid of the garbage. Clean your mind out from all thoughts of dependency of anything other than God. Wash your hands is the next thing. That means don't even believe in your own powers in the sense that, like when a person says, my genius and my great uh, 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 talents have made me my wealth. In other words, a person believes in himself that I've, that because of my uh, whatever accomplishments and so on and so forth, I've made a living. I know every penny, literally every penny, is given to me directly by God, even though God wants me to do things naturally within the world to make a living. But I know that it's only God that has given it to me. That means washing my hands from any kind of feeling that I have control over my destiny. Okay? So again, I'm emptying myself, my, I'm wasting from the waste of thoughts of any other powers, including washing my hands myself. Then I put on the tefillin. The tefillin is like plugging in. Tefillin is literally, you plug, when you put on the tefillin, today's days, it's so, people can appreciate it so much more, it's like sinking your phone. So that means sinking yourself with God. Literally plugging into God, charging. So that's the vacus. So now you clean, once you've emptied from anything else, you're plugging into God. Then you read the Shema, which means acknowledging and recognizing God's oneness. There's no other power besides Him. And now you pray. Because if you don't need, if you're just recognizing God's oneness, but you don't need anything, so then what's the basis of your surrender? The basis of your surrender is, God, you want to be in a relationship with me. And you want to provide to me. You want me to be your subject. I'm your, so I'm praying to you now that I know that you're the only power and the only one, I can fully, completely dedicate my thoughts and my, my entire being to you to serve you joyfully. And now I can accept upon myself your kingship with a complete heart and a complete soul. That's the ultimate accepting upon oneself one's heavenly king, the, the, the kingdom of God. Now during the time of exile, when the Jewish people don't have their sovereignty in the land of Israel, and we're under the, under the power of foreign, of foreign rulership, which is Edom, which, by the way, includes not just the physical space where the Jewish people being in different countries and therefore have to pay taxes and this and that and all kinds of things in which you have government rules and we're including the extra persecutions that were against the Jewish people. I'm not talking about that. It, that too, but included in that are the spiritual constrictions that create, that, that this represents that make nature seem to be so real and so powerful, mother nature and everything that it, that it represents. The forces that, that we say, that's just 
That's just the world. That's just reality. That's just the way things are that govern our lives other than realizing that there's no other power other than God that governs everything. So during the time of exile, it's very, very hard to, to, to feel that. Where do we see that? Also, everything is Torah. Everything is Allah. Allah is that three times a year, every Jew had to come to the Holy Temple and show his face and bow down in front of Hashem. That's the halach. Now there is one exception, it says. The exception is that people that are, are that if you're a servant, if you're a slave, you're a servant to a, to a master, you are not obligated to come to, to God, to the Holy Temple, to the Beis Amidish. Mitzvah's oil asriya, to show yourself in front of Hashem. Why? Because it says three times a year you should come see your master God, only a person who doesn't have another master over himself. Someone who has another master other than God over himself doesn't have to come. So you see from here that having another master, being subservient, being, being, um, having to, to uh, own up to someone else other than God creates a certain blockage and a certain interference. And therefore, this is what the, this is what the ruler said to... Um, this is what this nobleman said to Rebbe, um, to the sage. He said, who's going who's gonna to grab the kingdom after us? Who's going to take the kingship after us? Kingship, he's referring to kingdom of God. He says, spiritually, what does it mean that you're under the dominion of God? That means that you completely recognize and appreciate and understand that Enod Movada, there's nothing but Hashem, and Hashem is the only power in my life. He says, after our abuse, that we've abused you and cornered your soul with so much darkness after we've you surrounded you and encompassed you with so much of this concealment and darkness in which we've dominated the Jewish people for thousands of years. You've, we've impressed upon your, 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 you so much of the falsehood that there's other powers, other dominions, other, including the powers of nature and so on and so forth, which seem that they hold power over you that even if you're going to come to a state of enlightenment, even if you're going to come to a time when truth will be evident everywhere, you're still going to have a memory and a trace of the old stuff, and it's always going to bother you. This is again related to a Mishnah that I've mentioned in the last few weeks. The Mishnah says in Pirkei Avas that when you teach a young child, it's like teaching that have never heard any before. It's like teaching on a clean piece of paper. When you're teaching an old person who has already impressed upon himself other ideas, it's like erasing and, take, and writing something on an erased piece of paper. And also there's an interesting thing. One of the sages, uh, Abaya, was one of the great sages of the Talmud, said about a certain thing that he heard. One day he got excited, he heard a certain teaching, and he said, if I would have merited this, I would have heard this in my younger years. And the Talmud says, what's the benefit of hearing it in your younger years? So the Gemara answers that that because if I would have heard it in my younger years, it would have impressed itself upon me so much deeper, I would have never forgotten it. So this is what the, this is this is the question. He is, and just like I'm saying, just like it is in the, on the individual person as an individual, it's also on the collective consciousness and memory of a nation. In other words, this is an individual person. Every person is individual. What you've been impressed upon when you're young, it's very hard to cleanse yourself from that and appreciate a new reality if you've already taken in if you've already, as we spoke last week, if you have already graffiti written all over you. So this is what the nobleman is saying. We've graffitied you so much with our, with our falsehood and blockages of God, even when Mashiach will come, and even when you will return to the land of Israel, even when you enter into this tremendous godly consciousness, you're going to be, you're still going to have the memory and the distortions of what we've planned. Therefore, you're never going to be able to have the, what Rabbi Yochanan said earlier, clean your mind, purify yourself, and accept God, and know that He's the only power in a full, in the full manner. So what did he answer him? So therefore what he did was he bought him a, a clean piece of paper. And, and to understand this, he adds one more, the answer. Something that I said before, but even stronger than what we said before. There's a verse that says, a pasuk, that says a very frightening pasuk. I think in, it's in Yermio and Jeremiah. It says, Nafla v'loisaisiv kum besulas Yisrael. She has fallen, and she will never get up again, the daughter of Israel, the virgin of Israel. 
God, it seems to be, God forbid, a horrific prophecy that the Jewish people had at their power, but they've been trapped, they've fallen, and they'll never get up again. So the Talmud asks the question, what, is that, what does this verse mean? So the Talmud says, you have to, you have to know where to put the comma. Nafla, she has fallen. Veloy toisiv, she will not fall again. That's what it means. She has fallen once. Veloy toisiv, she will not continue to fall. She won't fall again. And then you read the words, Kum besulas Yisrael. Get up, virgin of Israel. The Jewish people get up. So the kum is not she will not get up again. She won't, she won't rise again. The loy says if she will not fall again. Kum, stand up, besulas Yisrael. The, 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 but he asks the question, why does the, the verse emphasize over here that the Jewish people are a virgin? And the answer is exactly what we had been spoke, speaking about before. We have to realize that the 2,000 years of darkness is just a dream, it's a nightmare. But there's no reality to it, there's no truth to it. I mean, in our world today, the way we experience things, we can't imagine that all the pain and suffering of the world for thousands of years and spiritual darkness, the stifling spiritual darkness is something that can, that, that, that's not real. It's impossible for us to realize that. Because we haven't yet entered into the full experience of Messianic or Mashiach consciousness. But once we will enter into that reality, we will realize that this was just a, it was just a dream. It had no reality to it. Which means that the government and that, and that whole spiritual exile that we've been through and the darkness that it represented of Edom has never been. And therefore we realize that we're not, it's not like we've already had an, like, the relationship with God sometimes is compared to a husband and a wife. And God is our husband, and we're his, we're his wife. The Jewish people are going to be like a virgin. They've never had relationships. They've never had an intimacy with anybody else. Because that which we've had another master was never real. And he brings us something very interesting. He says, the, 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 the uniqueness of this exile is that the Mashiach that's going to come, the Redeemer that it's going to come, he's not just going to redeem the world from here on and forward, he's going to retroactively redeem all of history. He's going to, un, he's going to rewrite everything that happened. Everything is going to have new meaning. Because we're soon going to see the godly intention behind everything. And then we're going to realize that the, what, when we thought that, that, that Spain was in control, France was in control, the United States was in control, this was on, Putin was in control, Russia, the Tsars were in control, it's Baba Mises, it never was. It was God all along. Uh, and he gives an example to that, where you can see something like that. The ten tribes, the ten brothers, ten sons of, of were at Joseph's mercy. And he, Yosef at Tzadik, And he was giving them a very rough time. And they thought that he is the ruler of Egypt. They interpreted and they came back to their father trembling. That we went down to Egypt, we met this guy, he was very hostile to us. But after they came back and they realized this, when Yosef revealed himself to them, I was your brother all along. It was me. And I never, I meant to harm you. I was, I was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was, I was trying to bring you to a point that I can reveal myself to you. So when we don't have all the information, when we look at it, it seems like the Germans may, um, 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 perpetrated a holocaust against the Jewish people. The, uh, the Russian Cossacks perpetrated a, the massacres, so forth. The Spanish and the Portuguese made the Inquisition on Israel. The uh, Germans, the French, and the English uh, soldiers came up upon a crusade and massacred thousands of Jews. The Romans butchered the Jewish people and, and, and in, in the times of the... I mean, that's, 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 that's our story of history. Until the lights turn on, and suddenly God appears, appears and he says, I'm Yosef all along. I've been there all along. And the whole story is a story of love, which now we can't appreciate and understand. That's the idea that the Rebbe mentions, that Moshiach is not a new thing. Moshiach, Moshiach doesn't undo the Golas. He reveals the Aleph in Goyla and it becomes Geula. That's Moshiach. That's the meaning of why he took the paper out and showed it to him. And he says, you totally don't get it. You're arguing and you're saying that we've been that we have all this contamination from thousands of years of abuse. It's not true. We are a clean heart. Once the exile comes out, we're clean all along. And that's what he meant when he said... Um, oh, well, but one more last point, and then I'm going to conclude. One more last point. He says, but you're still going to ask the question. 
even though from God's perspective, it was always true that there was never really an exile and God was really, you know, and, and it was really only kindness and goodness that we don't understand, but we'll see one day. But in our minds, as we interpreted it for thousands of years, we interpreted it as gloom and doom. So therefore, that's still going to have an impact on us. So the answer to that question is that the Jewish people from the very beginning knew the secret. That they were going to go through a horrific experience where it seems like his Yaakov's, Jacob, Yaakov's older brother, Esau, is going to call the shots and is going to abuse him and is going to put him through the ringer. But Yaakov always knew all along that he's in control, meaning it's God in control, and it's ultimately for the, for the purpose of the ultimate revelation of, the, of, godly king, of God's kingship in the world. And since Yaakov, the Jewish people, knew that all along, we've been saying Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem Echad, even though everything in our reality was contradicting that Echad. And that's the deeper meaning that Yaakov, from day one, Yaakov, little Yaakov, little baby Yaakov, who has a history still of, he's going to have to deal with his brute brother Esau and everything that Esau represents, his hand is holding on to Esau's heel. He's in control. Even though he's going to get beaten and pummeled by him, he knows he's in control all along. And that's the idea that Jews throughout history, even in the gas chambers, and crawled out Shema Yisrael. They looked the Germans in the eye and said, you're nothing, you have no power over us. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Lekeinu, Hashem Echad. I believe only I'm in God's hands, no, no, no other power in the world. They realized the Echad. And since we, re- even though we didn't consciously fully understand it, and we maybe we had questions, but our faith for one moment didn't falter. And we knew all along this truth. And since we had it all along, therefore, your false narrative never was imprinted on our consciousness because we, we intrinsically knew the truth. So it's not only a truth that later is going to reveal, be revealed and retroactively it's going to change, it's from the beginning already going to be different. And now we understand the depth of everything in this, in this, in this dialogue. The nobleman is saying to him, who is going to be able to take, are, are you ever going to be open for true kingship, divine kingship, to truly accept and be in the deepest relationship with God after the abuse? So he was trying to say to him, you're zakein, you're old. Remember, he says in the end, you're zakein chadash, you're an old, you're an old sage. But oh, you're a sage, you're old but new. That's... They were trying to say to the Jewish people, you're already old. If you're an old man, teaching an old man something, you've... In, in the youth, we've already, we've already, we've already polluted your, your consciousness. So he says, no, Zakan, I'm old, Chadash, but I'm still young. And Dvarim Yeshenim, he says, see, old, it's old thing. Is it new or is it old? No, Dvarim Yeshenim, it's old, meaning to say throughout all the, and even throughout all the dark times, we've always known the secret. It's not a new, it's new because all, whatever, the other side was trying to imprint upon us, never took hold. That's why we're, we're, we're like new people today, ready to absorb new light and new truth. But it's really old because we've always known this all along, even though we couldn't understand it, appreciate it intellectually, but we've always known it all along. And that's why he concludes, see how much pain that Tzaddik had. That's the idea that the Jewish people throughout the history pain themselves to hold on to this truth that there's no one but him. Even though, in the midst, a thousand years ago, 300 years ago, even 70 years ago, even just 10 years ago or 5 years ago, it was very hard to say Shema Yisrael Hashem Akeinu Hashem Echad. But now, as we're seeing God's unity in the world being revealed more and more, like we discussed in the beginning of the class, it's becoming more obvious. I had much more to say today, but we didn't get to it. Shall we continue Be'ezer Sashem next week? Hopefully way before next week, we're going to be already in the third temple coming of Mashiach.